Why so I'm know? I'm going to uh, rattle through and uh, address the question of how people respond to receiving personalized risk information um, about a condition for which changing their behavior could reduce that risk, to consider the extent to which uh, expectations that people might have should uh, or have been dashed. So my focus is very much on the behaviors that contribute most to population health. So I'll just uh, sketch those out. We've heard about some of those already. Look at what the expectations are that communicating personalized risk information will change people's behavior. Um, rapidly review what the evidence is for that, and then uh, pose the question at the end uh, about expectations being dashed or modified as a result of that. So the behaviors that contribute most to population poor health are four sets of behaviors, um, smoking, excessive consumption of energy dense food in particular, excessive consumption of alcohol and physical inactivity. And they contribute globally. Um, and it's estimated that if all four of those behaviors were either removed or optimized, then around 70%, 75% of cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes would be prevented and around 40% of cancers. And because those behaviors tend to be patterned by socioeconomic status, it would also reduce the gap in life expectancy and years lived in good health between the rich and the poor. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar, this is what the proportion attributable fraction um, risk is for uh, years um, of life lost in England. And you can see in green, uh, these are the behavioral risk factors with some of the metabolic ones also being shaped by genes. We've heard about some of that already, as well as by behaviors. Changing behavior is difficult. There is no one way of changing behavior. We need multiple approaches. And people have begun to um, explore the extent to which providing people with personalized risk information may make a contribution. Now, the expectations that it will motivate people to change their behavior are high. And um, this is uh, uh, taken from a talk given by Francis Collins over 20 years ago, in which he describes what the outcomes are that are expected from the Human Genome Project. And one of the early fruits was what was described then as preventive medicine. And in that paper, he outlines a hypothetical case of a 23-year-old young man, John, who, amongst other things, smokes cigarettes. And Francis Collins imagines that 10 years on, um, though, uh, John would undergo a battery of, of genetic tests and he would learn that he had an increased vulnerability to a lung cancer. And uh, guess what? He stops smoking. I'll return to John later. Um, but the expectations were high amongst the scientists and a survey amongst physicians conducted around the same time, again, looking at predictive genetic testing, were that uh, such tests, if people learned about risks, it would increase the chances that they went for screening, change their diet and physical activity, and quit smoking. More recently, expectations, not just from genetic risk information, but biomarker risk information more generally, um, that um, predictive uh, prevention um, would uh, empower people um, to engage more with their health and change their behavior. This was in a, uh, a paper that was published as a prelude to a green paper, prevention is better than cure. So what evidence do we have um, about the realization of those expectations? So I'm going to talk first of all about the impact of um, personalizing risk information based on genetic biomarkers. So my group, we first looked at this uh, 10 years ago in an early uh, systematic review, and there were just seven uh, relevant clinical studies that we found. And at that time, they were showing no evidence of any change in behavior. 
Um, six years later, many more studies, 18 randomized controlled trials, and uh, as you can see, looking at smoking cessation, uh, impact on diet, physical activity, and attendance at screening or behavioral support programs. Very mixed in terms of the populations, but the bottom line from that was that uh, we didn't see any evidence that communicating such information changed people's behavior. And just to give you a sense of the heterogeneity, just two of the forest plots from this, one for smoking and one for physical activity. Now, some may think, and we've already um, heard this mentioned uh, in Alison's talk, that perhaps what people are responding to is the genetic nature of the uh, biomarker risk information, a sense of fatalism. So, um, oh, sorry, before getting on to that. Um, so one of the critiques of that review uh, came from John Ioannidis and Mew Corey, uh, which is a lot of the studies involved um, single gene uh, tests. And uh, they said that really uh, the field has moved on and uh, really we should be looking at um, uh, risk scores from uh, multiple genes. So they uh, conducted a review and looked at four studies uh, where multiple um, genes had been looked at. In fact, two were included in our review. And what they found there were no effects um, when these um, multiple common genes were looked at. And revealing in terms of their expectations, they write in the discussion that they were disappointed by these results. So, as I said, um, some have argued that perhaps it's the genetic nature of this risk information. Well, the evidence suggests that it isn't to do with the fact that it's genetic. When we look at the evidence for non-genetic biomarkers, we can see a similar flat line in terms of behavioral consequence. And probably um, the best, uh, the lowest risk trial, and uh, I, I have an interest here. I was one of the authors. This is the trial that was led by Simon Griffin in Cambridge and used accelerometers um, for measuring physical activity. So you can see in terms of randomization, just under 600 adults, middle-aged adults were randomized to learn about their risks of diabetes, type two diabetes. Um, and in the control group, they were just told that they could keep their risks low or lower them by being physically active. Um, in the uh, genetic risk group, they were also given that information, but given an estimate of their likelihood of developing type 2 diabetes, and the phenotypic risk uh, estimate group were given uh, a risk, a personalized risk estimate, but um, didn't include a genetic assessment. And you can see from the bottom that there was no difference in responses according to uh, change in physical activity, as I say, objectively measured using accelerometer, according to whether it was genetic or phenotypic risk information. And importantly, um, there was no difference between the group, uh, e either of those groups, given the risk information and the control group. So um, what we have uh, is uh, five reviews that vary in terms of the inclusion criteria, but they're all coming up with a, a similar finding that there's little or no behavior change when information, people are given personalized risk information. So what's going on? Why don't people change their behavior? Um, the answer I think is in these two pictures. Um, so people are sensitive to risk information um, when uh, it's an immediate uh, risk uh, that's incompatible with life. Um, whereas most often the kinds of information we're presenting to people to try to change their behavior to reduce the risk of long-term threats, um, first of all, it's, um, it's, it's not an immediate threat. And there's a possibility that they can continue to engage in the behavior and they don't develop the condition. So if you like the threat very often isn't high enough, but even where people are motivated to change where the threat is high enough for them. The important thing is that environments have a very strong influence on our behavior and much stronger than we like to believe it has, uh, also known as the fundamental attribution error. 
So uh, have expectations changed uh, as a result of these studies? Um, I don't know. Um, I, I certainly for looking at how people have responded to genetic risk information and the results from those studies. There are some for whom I would classify them as having assimilated the evidence and uh, updated their expectations. There are some who, uh, for whom the jury is still out. And uh, there are others who I would suggest are carrying on regardless. So in terms of where the evidence lies and where I think the expectations should be updated, returning to John, so this expectation um, of uh, Francis Collins and others back uh, at the turn of the century, that um, this information would change John's behavior. Um, actually an evidence-based case, uh, taking smoking, it remains the most important preventable uh, cause of premature death and health inequalities. And at the moment, the most effective interventions are those that are population level um, that tackle the affordability, availability and advertising of tobacco. So to conclude, um, changing four sets of behavior, equitably would have the greatest effects on mortality and morbidity. And to date, the most effective interventions are those at a population level, so involve changing environments. And I've just given examples of three um, sets of variables that can be applied across populations. Expectations that personalized risk information would change behavior are high. Um, the evidence doesn't support that. But it may, uh, this risk information may change behavior if the environments are changed so that they're ones that more readily enable healthier behavior. And I think Alison's data very neatly speak to that, that point that you need these environments um, to uh, um, allow uh, the genetic susceptibility. And similarly, I think you need these um, uh, the healthier environments uh, for the information to stand a chance to be able to change people's behavior. So whether or not people's expectations have been dashed, I don't know, I haven't seen any studies on that. Um, whether or not they should be, I think they should be updated in the light of these data. Thanks very much.